Well, tonight, briefly, I just wanted to take a look at a passage of Scripture that's really dear to me, and uh, it's, it's kind of uh, ironic that it, it, it paints a picture between uh, something that we hear all the time at this time of, of the year, and that's New Year's resolutions. It paints a picture between those New Year's resolutions and maybe an alternative that would be more biblical and more honoring to the Lord and more helpful for us, quite honestly. So uh, if you would turn in your Bibles to the book of Ephesians, chapter 2. And I, I, I suspect that this scripture is going to be uh, pretty familiar. And uh, especially, if not all of it, parts of it for sure. So um, Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 10 um, the interesting thing about Ephesians is uh, it's, it's six chapters, but it's broken down really um, systematically. The first three chapters are theology, and the second set of three chapters are uh, practice. So it's almost as if Paul is teaching for three chapters, and then when he gets to chapter 4, verse 1, he says, Therefore... Uh, I implore you, walk you know, in a manner worthy of the calling with which you've been called. So he, he changes gears and says, all right, here's what I wanted to teach you now. Here's how you put it into practice. And so we're in the midst of the teaching part in, in this chapter, in this part of this chapter. And the other interesting thing is about, about Paul is he's the king of the run-on sentence. He, uh, for example, chapter 1 of Ephesians Verse 3 to verse 14, one sentence. Verse 15 to verse 23, one sentence. You know, chapter 2, verse 1 to verse 10, one sentence. <laughs> so he's just like, he keeps having these long thoughts that are all connected. And so in this one sentence, Ephesians 2, 1 through 10, there are four distinct parts of the sentence, things that kind of guide us into a more full understanding of how Jesus takes us from death to life. And in those four distinct parts, there's one main idea. And it's found uh, in verse 4 in the first two words. But God. That, that theme kind of runs through these ten verses. Uh, things were going this way, but God did this. Uh, I, I didn't have any hope, but God. You know, I could have been much worse off than I am but God and so that, that that's the theme it kind of always brings us back to God is doing some things and so as we come to the end of one year and going into a new year I think it's helpful for us to recall things that God's doing and that he he's not going to stop doing these things that you know you talk about everything going on in the world and you know things some, sometimes seem discouraging around us God's not stopping his work. You know, he, he's not watching the evening news and wringing his hands and worried about what's going to happen. He's not, that's not how he operates. Okay? So let me read these ten verses, and then there's, like I said, four distinct portions here we're going to look at about how God is at work. Ephesians 2, verse 1. And you were dead... In your trespasses and sins, in which you formerly walked, according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, of the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience. Among them we too all formerly lived in the lusts of our flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest. But God being rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you've been saved. And raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenlies in Christ Jesus, so that in the ages to come he might show the surpassing riches of his grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand 
so that we would walk in them. Now that's one big thought and it's full of information. So let's take it one piece at a time and see what, uh, what God's telling us through Paul into this church letter uh, from all these years ago. First of all, we need to understand our condition apart from Christ. Where, where we were, if you are in Christ now, where were you? Or if you're not in Christ now, where are you? And so, uh, see what it looks like to be without Jesus. We're basically governed by evil and by Satan. We're dead. The Bible says we're dead in our trespasses and sins. Right off the bat, verse 1. You were dead in your trespasses and sins. Now that's important because it gives us a more full understanding of the, the extent of of God's work what is a dead person able to do on their own nothing nothing so that that's important from the very beginning when Paul says you were dead in your trespasses and sins that's that's helping us see the the depth uh, the, that God would go to the extent of his work in our lives to to save us from our sins so we were dead dead people are powerless to do anything to save themselves and then the bible uses this word in verse 2 in which you formerly walked according to the course of this world and then in verse 3 again among them we too all formerly lived in the lust of our flesh and indul indulging the desires of the flesh and of the mind so there's a, a good picture of a past um, existence, a past condition, so to speak. So this is what you used to be uh, if you have now been saved by God. This is who you used to be. Now, he here's a, a good way to think about the reason why that is the way it is. Because um, at the end of verse 3, it says, We were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest. So wh what does that mean? So here's a good way to, to visualize. Have you ever observed or maybe seen a, a video or heard a story or, about a, a child born to a mother who was addicted to drugs? Now, now think about this logic. That child didn't take any drugs. That child had no say in that decision, but that child has the same blood flowing through their veins as flowing through the mama's vein. So whatever the mama puts into their bodies goes into the bloodstream of that child. So that child is born with those characteristics and suffering from those uh, difficulties, not of any action on their own, but they were born that way. They were born with that blood th flowing through their veins. So... Even though they did not do that, they're suffering from something that's passed on. So Adam and Eve rebelled against God, and they brought sin into the world. Well, every human being now is born with the nature that is inclined towards sin because of that. And so we're, by nature, children of wrath. We're born with this curse. On uh, All mankind is is born with this curse of sin. And so now you see even more clearly, I hope, the great need that we have for Jesus. Uh, because that's a, that's a problem that we can't fix on our own. So we have to have Jesus to do it, but God. Verse 4, this is the second thing that we can see in this sentence. First of all, we understand our condition apart from Christ, but now we need to embrace this this new reality that comes from being united with Christ. Because in verse 4, everything is changed. The Bible says, but God. Now look at, look at the, the attributes here. Rich in mercy. So mercy is withholding the punishment that we deserve. Great love, and it's directed toward us. And then even when, so that, that tells me that God did not take our 
current state and circumstance and say, oh, well, you need to get your stuff together before you come to me. He, he, he didn't say that. Even when, the Bible says, despite the fact that we're dead sinners in rebellion to God, even when we were still dead in our transgressions, uh, verse 5 says, he made us alive together with Christ. He made us alive, recipients of love and mercy. And so that's a, that is a, an active action on God's part and a passive action. on. We're the receiver of that gift. He made us alive. And so even in, like if you, if you were to go back just a few verses back to the end of chapter 1, verse 19, um, the, uh, let's see, yeah, verses 19 and following, the surpassing greatness of his power toward us who believe they're in accordance with the working of his, the strength of his might, which he brought about in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places. So now you, you see what he did to, for Christ, you know, God raised Jesus from the dead. Well, that, that, uh, the words he uses there is exactly what uh, the Bible says about us now. Because in verse 20, he raised him from the dead, seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places. In verse 6, he raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ. So you see what that means. Salvation is being united with Christ, being with Christ in glory. So there's a, a lot of uh, good consequences to salvation of what God has done for us. He raised Jesus from the dead. He will raise us from the dead. He raises us up with him seats us with him in the heavenly places. Now here's a question when you get to the end of this section. Like verses 4, 5, and 6. So if you were to stop there, here, here might be the question that you would be asking. Well, why would he do all that? Why would God, if, if we really are what verses 1, 2, and 3 tell us we are, why would he do that? If we're dead in our trespasses and sins and we're indulging in our desires and uh, children of wrath as the rest of mankind, why would he do that? Well, the Bible tells us in verse 7, so that he might show the surpassing riches of his grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. He's wanting to demonstrate who he is and his grace and his kindness and what Christ has done for us. So think about our change in um, status. You remember, remember in grade school how there always seemed to be like different groups of kids. Like you might have some kids that were maybe kept to themselves or maybe more quiet or but then you had some that seemed like they were just the popular crowd you know they were they just they were everybody looked at them and and looked up to them or you know for whatever reason you know nothing nothing that was really legitimate really because they're just people like everybody else but you know there's always those little cliques in school you know how some some are popular so but so what what would happen if you started hanging around with the with the cool kids so maybe you sit at the cool kids' table at lunch. Well, if, I'm, if I get to sit beside somebody who's popular, what does that do for me? I get associated with them. So now I get a, a, an increase in status just, because, just being with them, just being close to them. Like if I get to hang out with Pat Allen Hutto, then immediately that changes the way people look at me. <laughs> right yeah wait, wait wait that's not the kind of example i was talking about but okay i understand what you're saying so the point is we didn't do any of this god did all this but we're reaping the benefits you know the bible says that even when we were dead in our transgressions god made us alive together with christ so so all these benefits are coming not from something we've achieved, but it's something that God has d brought about in Christ. So we receive a combination of grace and mercy, which means we get to miss out on the bad stuff we deserve, 
and then we get to enjoy the good stuff we don't deserve. Grace and mercy work together like that. So we need to see what our condition was apart from Christ, embrace the reality of being united with Christ, but then the third thing is understand how that happens. How do we become united with Christ? Verses 8 and 9 are some of the more often quoted verses out of this chapter, out of this book even. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, For by grace you've been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It's the gift of God. So this kind of separates us from that, uh, the, the all too common self-reliance attitude. Oh, I can do it. I just have to try harder. I just have to work harder. I just have to do better. I can do it. Not spiritually speaking. You know, we, we can't do better. We can't do well enough or be good enough. We, we can't do that. We, we can't make it on our own. We cannot earn salvation. There's nothing we could do that would be enough to commend ourselves to God where he would say, oh, oh, okay, I didn't realize you had done all those things. Uh, you can come in. That, that's not how it works. Because if that were the case, then Jesus would not have had to die. The only reason Jesus died is because that was necessary for our salvation. It was necessary. We can't get there on our own. We can't, our best effort on our best day is not even close. It's all from God. It's God's grace. The Bible says we're saved by grace through faith and it's not of ourselves it's the gift of god and then in, and if that were not enough to make it clear verse 9 says it's not a result of works so nobody gets to brag right what happened and, and by the way this is a, just a side note if you were to read first corinthians chapter one near the end of chapter one you would see a a, a paragraph to where uh, paul says that god intentionally chose the weak in the world to shame the strong or the foolish to shame the wise the things that are not to shame the things that are and and then right before that he said you need to consider your calling consider who you were where you were what you were doing when god saved you because what difference does that make why would god choose weak people or foolish people or people who had no standing whatsoever instead of choosing prominent people or strong people or really intelligent why, why would he do that what what happens when god uses the weak in the world or the foolish in the world what does that show everybody who who gets the glory when something like that happens when, when God takes somebody who's nothing special and does something miraculous, you know what everybody says? Everybody who's thinking through this lens? Well, how did, the only way that could have happened is God did it. God gets the glory for that because there's no, there's no way on earth that would have happened because they don't have those gifts or abilities apart from the holy spirit so so god gets all the glory when that happens so just like that right here god is is showing why it's by his grace why it's not a result of works why we can't earn it. it's because he's going to get the glory for it not us we can't earn our way to heaven that's how we become united with christ so what what do we uh, what are we tempted to do on earth? Compare ourselves to other people. To try to find out our value as a person. Well, I can look around at other, well, I'm, I'm not doing as well as they are. But I'm not doing as bad as they're doing, so maybe I'm okay. But, but what are we really doing? We're, we're not doing anything that's uh, logical or it's not of, of any reality, really, because... The only comparison we make is us to Jesus. And we always fall short in that comparison. Because we can't get there on our own. God did that 
for us. So that shows us a better perspective of who we were, who God is, and what God's done, and how that benefits us so greatly. So that's understanding how we become united with Christ. Last thing, number four. Verse 10. Fulfill God's plan and purpose for you in Christ. This is um, a verse that's almost overlooked sometimes. Verse 10, after establishing who we were, what God did, how he did it, and then you get to verse 10, it's like, well, okay, what does that what does that matter? How does that affect me? It tells us why, uh, why we're in the position we are in Christ. What are we supposed to do with that? And so God tells us we are his workmanship, which means the, the top tier of his creative work, of his grace and mercy and love and kindness and, and his righteousness and holiness. He's created us in Christ with a purpose in other words we don't just get saved and say all right i'm done the race is over i'm gonna just sit here and wait till go to heaven i mean what what purpose would that serve right well god saved me so i'm going to heaven so i'm gonna just sit here and wait what uh i think it was c.s lewis who said uh, the da- or who remarked about the danger of being so heavenly minded you're no earthly good i mean if you th- it, 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 is it wrong to think about heaven and think about of course not that's that's encouraging but that reality ought to motivate us to do something while we're here god saves us in order for us to do good works the bible says We're his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand for us to walk in them or for us to do. So what he's saying is being united with Christ, we're created new in Christ. So now we are privileged and able to do good works. So instead of putting the cart before the horse and thinking, well, I have to do a lot of good works so maybe I can get to heaven, it's, God has saved me, so now I can do all these good works. And so I get to do this stuff, not so I can hope to be saved, but I get to do all these things because I have been saved. And uh, just like my, I say this, I'll, I've said this before, uh, my good friend up in Pendleton, he, he always says, we, we work from victory, not for it. We, we've, we've already been given what we need. So... We do good works because God prepared for us to do those. That's what, the, the, a benefit of us being saved. So that, in, in summary, that's, that's what this passage is showing us about being united with Christ, uh, understanding where we were, where God brought us, how he did it, and then what do we do now that we're there? We fulfill our plan and purpose that God's given us in Christ is to do good things for for others to serve and to to do good works so i mentioned at the very beginning uh something about new year's resolutions so here's how that applies to this cultural phenomenon what usually happens in your experience when you make a new year's resolution or you hear about somebody making a new year's resolution what usually happens to those how long they last a couple days a week maybe here's where i see it i'm about to see it let's see it's the 29th so uh in the next next week i'm going to see it in full view i'm going to show up to my gym on monday morning january the third and instead of being 10 people in there there's going to be 30 people in there and the 20 that are extra i will have never seen before and it's going to be crowded. It's going to be waiting on stuff and, you know, hard to get around. And because my gym's not real big. But, yeah, and that's exactly right. It happens every year. Every year. It's the, we always, we even talked about it this morning, the New Year's resolution crowd. They, you know, there's a bunch of people going to show up. And they're going to be in there for a week maybe. And then we'll never see them again the rest of the year. They paid their money. They came in there. They thought they had good intentions. And then, no, I'm not doing that. And then, then they're gone. And that's usually what happens, right? 
Because what is a New Year's resolution, really? It's just an idea. You know, it's just an idea. It's not, it's not a, a, a commitment that you're devoted to. It's not a change in your heart or your life. It's just, a, it's just an idea. Well, I really I ought to do that. Okay, I'm going to try to do that. And then I don't really like doing that. And then you don't do it anymore, right? That's a New Year's resolution. So the encouragement from this passage relative to that is don't make a new year's resolution go to jesus get a new heart you don't need a then you don't need to make a new resolution just get a new heart and then and then in christ you'll you'll have uh that commitment and surrender to to do things a new way that that he that he made possible right that that's the point of that so that's my prayer for us. If we're getting ready to come into this new year, we don't need to make new resolutions. We need to do what Jesus has put in our hearts to do, why he created us, and fulfill our purpose. Let's pray.